Good morning and welcome to Ask the Expert. I'm Joe Taylor. This morning, another in the ongoing series of programs presented by the Northwest Regional Key Program for Quality Early Learning. The program, through the Northwest Institute of Research, oversees a grant from the Office of Child Development and Early Learning at the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services and the Department of Education. The goal of the program is to improve the outcomes for young children as they prepare for school. John Poza from the Pennsylvania Key is the host of the program and is here with us throughout the series. And John, uh, understand we have a very important person on the line with us this morning. Yes, we do, Joe. I'm finally pleased to be able to welcome uh, our deputy, or actually our secretary of the Department of Human Services, Ted Dallas. Uh, We've been uh, trying to work with Ted to have him on the show for quite some time. Um, Ted actually uh, started as the uh, secretary of Department of Human Services back in January of 2015. Uh, Since taking over at the department, he's implemented a full Medicaid expansion that's provided health care to approximately 450,000 Pennsylvanians who were previously uninsured and began implementing several other significant reforms at the department. Previously, he served as the Secretary of the Maryland Department of Human Resources. So welcome to the program, Secretary Dallas. Thank you very much. I'm glad to hear there's going to be someone important on the, on the line. I'm waiting <laughs> to hear who that is. Oh, we're, we're just so glad to have you. And I'm glad <laughs> that you have a sense of humor as well. <laughs> well, uh, one of the first things that I wanted to talk to you about was specifically because our program deals primarily with, um, you know, child development and, and early learning. Um, there's, there's several changes uh, that are going forth in terms of the department's realignment strategies for this year. Uh, as it relates to the new federal child care development block grant requirements. Can you kind of give us an overview on to the average person who may not know what this all means, this block grant, which apparently hasn't been changed in quite a number of years? Um, I think there are a lot of changes that uh, will result from the block grant. One, for example, is uh, one that makes a change with regard to the redetermination period, and this is a little bit in the weeds, but it's an important thing. I think the changes in the block grant are designed to really help families, particularly working families. So I'll give you just one example um, of what uh, one of the things the block grant does is that as you um, – right now we have a redetermination period where we re- redetermine whether you're eligible for benefits or not. Now, a lot of times if you're a working family and you lose a job, you may also lose child care coverage uh, if the redetermination comes up during that same time period. So if you do that, if that happens, at the time you lose your job and you're looking for a job and you're going out for an interview or you're trying to um, get to places where you can find another job, you lose child care at the exact moment you need it the most. So one of the things the feds did was they lengthened the amount of time that we look at for redetermination if you're a family, if you're a working family, and giving you that extra time from, I think it was from six months to 12 months, that gives you more time if there's an interruption in the uh, in your work, say you uh, you're working at a you're working at a store or something, you lose that job and you have to go find another one. It gives you more time uh, where you have childcare to go look for that job. And I think the federal government's uh, goal there was to do something that was family friendly, do something that would help people as they're trying to navigate their way through the economy, particularly in jobs that sometimes turn over kind of quickly. So those kinds of changes, those things that hopefully make it easier for families to navigate the system, easier to get the childcare they need and also um, be able to carry on the, the, the other activities in their lives, whether that's the work, looking for a job, or other things. Those are the goals of the redesign of the block grant. Well, obviously, that's, that's extremely important because the one obviously goes with the other. We need people to work to be able to afford child care, uh, contributing to the economy, and also providing the uh, services for our children to make sure they're, they're ready for, for kindergarten and school. Um, through the I office. think it really is, uh, yeah. just one thing just to back up just a second, it, it, I mean, it is what you said is so critical. Um, for a lot of folks, particularly working families, child care can be as expensive as a mortgage payment. It can be the single biggest, besides a mortgage payment, the single biggest expense that uh, families have. So if we want families to get out there to work, to be able to move forward, to be able to move up that career ladder and get new jobs, we also have to give them the ability to, to get to work while they're taking care of their family. Yeah, I wanted to talk about um, Ockdale uh, specifically, which is one of the uh, offices under the Department of Human Services. Um, 
Now, th there is currently efforts to uh, integrate and align services. And can you tell us a little bit about what some of the changes are uh, in that department that's taking place right now? Sure. Um, just to, to set the table a little bit, I think it's important just to spend a second talking about how the system grew up, right? It, grows, it grew up like a lot of things in government grew up, grew up. It grows up in pieces, right? You rarely have the perfect knowledge. You learn things along the way, all the money you would need to build the system from scratch and, you know, start with nothing and then build up to something. So as it builds up over time, you build it in pieces. Right? And as you build it in pieces, uh, you add a piece here, you add a piece there. And governments are pretty good at that. They can add things on as we learn more things to change with the times. But we're not always good at um, taking the things away that are no longer relevant. And we're also not as good sometimes at looking at the system as a whole. So one of the things that um, the governor encouraged all departments to do, including the Department of Human Services, was to look at systems in a comprehensive way. And that's one of the things we did at DHS. So I often liken it to... Uh, I don't know if you guys remember that game Jenga, you know, the, where you have all the pieces, the, pieces, the pieces together, you build the tower, and then you take the pieces away. And if you take a piece away, some, sometimes nothing happens. Everything comes to crumbling the tower down, right? And yeah. then sometimes you take a piece away, and the whole thing falls down, right? Right. So I think when you look at the system overall, it's kind of like a Jenga tower. There are things that we have we have put in place that um, as we built it up over time, they were more relevant than they are now. We may be able to take some of those things away, make it a little easier for not only pro uh, families, but also for providers and other stakeholders in the system to navigate it. But we also need to make sure we maintain and strengthen the things that are the things that if we took them away, the whole system would crumble. So I think it's sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of taking a look at that at, at it from that way. And I use that example um, of, uh, every once in a while, and I think anyone who's ever played the game knows what I'm talking about. Some pieces you take away, nothing happens. Some pieces, you, you know, you have to keep in place. So what we did was we started, uh, uh, we, we decided, we asked, I asked our Deputy Secretary for Child Development and Early Learning, or OCDEL, um, to, uh, to work with stakeholders, right, so that it, w it would be a process by which we, um, we were able to engage with the people who really do the work. Um, we, you know, we do the overall administration and, super, and funding and supervision, but really also engage with the people who are, who are doing the work every day. So I think the process involved something like 700, or we got like 700 responses. There was no shortage of people who told us what they thought and uh, where we could improve. So uh, that was, was some really good feedback. So we got a lot of positive comments, but we got some comments about things that we thought we needed to improve. So some of the things that we heard from folks, for example, were, and I know um, all of you guys will be stunned that some people said this about government, but we had things that people said we were inconsistent in how we monitor people. We were, you know, we had different standards for the same thing depending on where you were. There was too much paperwork. Um, we had multiple visits by different staff monitoring, in some cases, the same thing. Um, that all that administrative oversight, while important, maybe had gone overboard to the point that it took away from people's ability to uh, teach and care for kids. That wasn't our intent, but that sometimes happened. And then also we heard some comments about communications being inconsistent or policy uh, clarifications not getting out to everybody the way they would. But basically that was the message we heard of the places where uh, folks thought that we could, we could do better. So for us, we took that to heart, and we're trying to make those changes. Now, it took us, I think the system that we're operating under now probably has been in place for, has grown up over the last 15 years. I'm not sure that we'll have it all sorted out in the next six months, but we are taking some steps that I think um, will make things move in the right direction. So things that are, you know, some basic common sense things and things that um, I think will help make the system a lot better. And the goal, of, the goal has got to be always, we want to, while maintaining the integrity of the programs and making sure that we're spending the money appropriately, we can maximize the amount of time that people spend caring for kids, and, and which is the goal of the program, and teaching our kids. And the impact that will have in their lives down the road, uh, I think a lot of your listeners probably know that, but um, that investment at this stage in their life will pay, pay dividends down the road for the adults they'll become the amount of services they may need, particularly if they're vulnerable kids right now, they might need throughout their lives. So everybody from business CEOs to guys in the military to, uh, you know, social workers to government bureaucrats, we all know how important this investment is. So some of the things that we're, we were looking at are, for example, um, when you're entering a system, the application you have to fill out. 
finding instead of having three different applications for three different programs and making everyone fill out all that paperwork and have to fill that out on a regular basis, can we have a shared application? One one that consolidates a lot of the same information and may ask some different questions at the end, but a shared application that um, allows people to make it easier to get in and provide uh, the services that we want. Can we do joint monitoring visits or inspections, right? There was a in, there was a, a federal audit from the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington of several states, including Pennsylvania, and it showed um, some safety conditions at some of our facilities, and um, it was not a flattering portrait of some of some of our providers, but also this and this was similar across the country. But is there a way that we can have those monitoring programs be consolidated so that when we go out there, we're not just looking for set A of issues and ignoring set B, but we're really looking across the spectrum and we're doing it in an in a efficient, coordinated way so that we can get out there more often and we can measure the things that really need to get measured. Um, the budget documents and all, and all the paperwork that folks have to do, right now it can vary um, tremendously. It can be inconsistent. Um, one of the other things that makes OCDEL or uh, Child Development and Early Learning an interesting thing is it's the only department or only office in the state that is under two departments. So while it's under the Department of Human Services here, it's also under uh, the sec uh, Secretary of Education, my, my friend uh, Pedro Rivera, who's a uh, great Secretary of Education. There are two agencies that it reports to. So when you're looking at all those things there, is there a way that we can align the definitions and the rules? Uh, education's got their rules. DHS has got their rules. Can we get that? Uh, can we get those things consolidated down again with the goal of making it easier? And then I guess the last thing I would say is it also has to be um, something that's more consistent. And I had mentioned that a little earlier. When you uh, one of my one of my pet peeves with the federal government is sometimes there's a, a standard where you know if you're in Region Three here that covers Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, they'll have certain rules there. And then if you're in, in but if you look at Region Two or Region Four. Something that's okay from the federal government's perspective in Region 4 might not be in Region 3. And, yeah, I always think that's a little unfair. And, uh, and I sort of grumble about it when I'm dealing with the federal government. The bad thing is we often do the same thing here depending on the region of the state. So if I'm going to grumble when the, when the federal government does to me, I better fix it here in Pennsylvania and make sure we don't do the same thing. So I think if we do all those things, and we get, you know, the good news is a lot of this stuff is common sense. The bad news is it's going to take a little while to get the, the, the government to react that way. But if we can do all those things, we can get it to a place where you can spend the most time teaching and caring for kids and less time dealing with us. Now, I'm not saying it's not important to make sure that we get all the paperwork we need to so the federal government's okay with how we're spending their money, how this, you know, that the state is okay with how the money is being spent. But I think there's got to be a way that we can do that in a more sim in a simplified way that allows you to maximize the amount of time that you're caring and teaching uh, kids. If I can, can I take this closer to the ground, our particular ground here in rural Pennsylvania? I think we have some unique situations and mindsets that uh, may impede progress toward the area having more kids enrolled in high-quality early education programs. And one that I've observed is parents of young children not knowing where to find these programs. Uh, what is being done with all the bureaucracy that you're talking about to help parents of three- or four-year-olds here in rural Pennsylvania know where to find these programs? So I think that is, is a couple things, right? So I should have added that those are some of the things that are underway. There are more recommendations coming to both Secretary Rivera and myself this fall from those 700 folks who gave us responses. So there will be some more things along the way. But I think you rightly also brought in you know, what does this mean for families, right? It's one thing when you're talking about the folks who provide the services, but, you, but it always has got to be about the family. So there's a phrase that we like to use in, in social services. It's uh, no wrong door, right? So we say um, that's the message we try to give to folks. And, and, and that's just a, a phrase to help remind people that it should never be our response that if you're looking for help, no matter where that is, whether you go to the local your school, whether you go to a county assistance office, whether you go to a child care provider, it should never, it should hopefully never be the case that if you walk in that door, someone tells you, oh, you've come to the wrong place, you need to go down the hall, you need to go across town, you need to go somewhere else because we don't do that. What, it really, what the goal is, and we're not by no means there, the goal is that when you walk in that door, 
we can we if you're if you can get the services you need, we can make you aware of services that you might not even know were there. But we can we can get you started on that process wherever you walk in the door in the system. It's got to be a place that when we do the outreach to people, at the, you know, if we send notes home with kids at school, if we uh, you know put up information out in county assistance offices, we do public service announcements. However, we get the information out there. If someone can get into contact with us anywhere in the system, then that, the answer can never be when someone does that, that you hit, you've come to the wrong place and you need to go somewhere else. You've got to make the answer be that we're going to get you, in, we're, now that you've come and asked for us for help or for services, we're going to find a way to get you what you need, and we're not going to tell you you've got to go somewhere else. On that note, uh, Secretary, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, a new early learning program search site that providers uh, can update with customized information. Now I'm talking about child care providers as well as additional changes to come. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this site on how it's going to uh, make government work better as well as increase access to high quality early education services? So I think for, for search site, if it's the site I think you're referring to, I think the idea is finding a place where uh, folks can get information online and be able to get the information they need. I'm not 100% sure I'm familiar with this. Uh, well, with it's, it's, thing, it's referred to as Compass now, and I don't know Compass. if it, yes, oh, okay. yeah, if there's going to be a, updates to Compass or if there's going to be a new site sure. altogether. Okay, so yeah, Compass, I know, search site was, a, we have, a, we, I didn't know it by that name, but Compass is the eligibility system that we have that allows people to enroll in benefits. And when I said uh, no wrong door before, Compass is one of those things that hopefully gets there. So one of the things you can do when you get the Compass is they can tell you the benefits that are available, but they also, you can do a screen for benefits that tells you here, you know, you put in some basic information and they say you may be eligible for the following things. And it may be things you don't know about or you weren't even necessarily thinking about, but you may be eligible for that. You'd have to go through the full application process to find out if you're 100% if you're eligible. But the screening process allows you to say, you know, here's some basic information about how much money I make, how many people are in my family, what ages they are, those sorts of things. And it, it can tell you, you may be eligible for those things. Would you like to apply for those benefits? Now, that's something, is that a service that uh, someone can access online? Yes, if you go to the department's website. And just so that the folks who may not realize, what is that website so that they would know? It's uh, dhs.pa.gov. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the things that's, that's uh, obviously uh, a big part of our program is talking about the quality rating improvement system, or otherwise known as Keystone Stars for child care and preschool in Pennsylvania. And I know that there was a study done through the William Penn Foundation and the University of Pennsylvania as part of the um, uh, revisioning of the STARS uh, process. Um, what was learned through that study uh, and identified, and what steps have been taken to help refine that program? So um, just to start some background for folks who might not be as familiar with Keystone Stars, the system's probably about 14, 15 years old right now, uh, much like when we were talking earlier about how the process works at the beginning of, uh, of the discussion. Um, it is, it, it is a, a similar thing. There are some Jenga Tower parts to it as well. There are about half a million kids who need some type of child care in the state. And right now, um, the way we rate the, the facilities that provide services is we, uh, with the Keystone Stars program. So you can either have no stars, one star, two stars, three stars, or four stars, four stars being the highest, no stars obviously being the lowest. So for us, it was, uh, it's a way that we could uh, send a signal to parents and to also to provide, let providers send a signal to parents this is where quality child care is. And, and the reason why I think that's important is um, every, we had talked a little earlier about the importance of child care and what that investment um, can do for vulnerable children throughout their life. But the key uh, thing there is it's got to be quality child care. So just any child care isn't, isn't going to get it done, isn't going to make, get the results that folks want. And I know we all, you know, and for us, we, we believe and we know that parents always want what's best for their kids. So if they can get them into one of those higher star ranked facilities, we are hoping that they will, will be able to do that. So um, right now, um, 40, I think if the number is something like 48% of them are in a three or four star rated uh, facility. That's great that almost half of them are, but that means that um, more than half of them are in uh, programs that are not. 
So that's the challenge that's in front of us. And that's where that study that you mentioned comes in. The William Penn Foundation and the University of Pennsylvania did something that I'm not sure that a lot of other states have done, is they were able to look at, over time, the star rating and whether the, the things that we said you had to do to go from a star one to a star two or a star three to a star four, whether those things actually resulted in uh, higher proficiency or better skills for kids or really helped those kids or whether they were things that bureaucrats thought would help improve quality but don't necessarily have that impact on quality. So what the study found was there is a, there is a significant difference between three and four providers and one and two providers. It may not be as big a difference between a one and a two and a three and a four, but the difference between those two groups is big. There is a huge, there is a, 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 a real difference in the quality of care and the, the proficiency and skills that your child will have if you can get them in a three or, three or four star provider as opposed to a one or two star provider. And um, it's something that you would hope that everybody would be able to say, but um, it is one of those things because you have to look at it over time. Not every state has been able to do a study like that. So we're very grateful to Penn and uh, University of Pennsylvania, my alma mater, Bill Penn, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, the William Penn Foundation for doing that, uh, that study. So one of the things we saw there, as I mentioned, was that over time there's that big difference between the two and the three provider, right? So what we need to do is we need to find a way at ways to encourage those one and two providers to make that shift to, uh, to be a three or four provider because we, now we know the impact that it had. So similarly to the process I said before, we had a lot of stakeholders, right? We wanted to make sure that it wasn't just um, what I in the state I call um, Barney meetings, which are, you guys remember the, the big dinosaur Barney? It of was course, a, yes. State officials get together and they look at each other and they say, you're great. No, they say, no, no, you're great. And I love you, and you do a great job, and we all feel better about ourselves when we do it, but nobody really does anything afterwards. And if you go to those meetings, they're great for your self-esteem, but they're maybe not so great for um, actually moving the ball down the field or, or improving. So we wanted to talk to the folks who provide the services here again. And then, you know, we asked them, you know, what do you think the strengths of the program are? What do you think the weaknesses of the program are? So they told us things that they liked about the program. They liked that, you know, it actually – it was a way to demonstrate quality and the importance of quality and the state was doing that. They like the fact that we have a tiered system where we pay a higher rate for those who have made the investment to provide higher quality. And they like the sort of strength based strength based ooh, I can't speak today. Uh, strength based approach and uh, technical assistance that we provided. Those are the things they like. But some of the things that they they said there are weaknesses or things that we need to do better at are um, the administrative work that's there. The time that we give people to uh, to uh, comply with the STARS program, and then also um, while they liked the fact that we had a tiered reimbursement, the tiers were not uh, significant enough to help folks make that change. Right? They said we had some uh, redundant standards, things that were inconsistent. But really, the message to me, one of the things I heard, I remember I went to an event in uh, Philadelphia at uh, WHYY. And afterwards, I got to talk to some of the providers, and you know, I talked to some who were star two, and I said, well, what would it, you know, what would it take to get you to be a star three? Because we know that is, that's a really big difference. And they say, the things you have to do to get from a star two to a star three, some of those things are so big, we don't even try because we can't, we can't make it from here to there. So I think the, the work that's being done now to look at the STARS program is, are there ways that we can incentivize people along the way to make that investment in quality and help them get there so that if there are two, you can get credit and the world and a parent can see, um, even if you are a star two, you're, you're much closer to being a star three than being a star two or a star one, or you're, if you're a star two, that you're just barely a star two, and that when parents are making those choices and people are making that investment and we're, and we're finding ways to reimburse folks, you can get credit along the way because hopefully if you do that, some of the things that, you know, there's all the things, if you look at all the things it takes to get from a start two to a start three are so big that you don't even try. If we can find ways to reward you as you make your, Secretary your, Dallas. Uh, you know, your trip along the way, that I think will make the difference. Secretary so Dallas. To do that, but Thank Go you. Ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, we have run out of time. Uh, the, all of this information is just. Maybe big. we can do another program. Yes. We have yes. so much to talk about. Obviously. Obviously. But I wanted to thank you. I, I hate to cut you short, but we're, we're, we just run out of time. But uh, thank you so much for being with us. And um, hopefully we'll have you on again. And that's our program for today. We'll be back in two weeks at the same time. 
In the meantime, you can go online to learn more at papromiseforchildren.com. For John Poza and the Northwest Regional Key Program for Quality Early Learning, I'm Joe Taylor. Thank you for listening and have a great day.